This is Frank Islam, Chairman and CEO of FI Investment Group and your host of Washington Calling, where we interview leading voices from business and politics that impact you, the viewer. Today, we are fortunate to have a distinguished guest. His name is Gurrez Hoda. Mr. Hoda is the founder trustee and the president of Hikmat Foundation. Previously, he was an Indian administrative service officer, also known as IAS and work with the World Bank. Welcome to our show. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Mr. Hora, you have had a very interesting and distinguished career as a civil servant in IAS, then at World Bank, and now with Hikmat Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about your career and your story, your journey, which is a remarkable for our global audience? Well, I mean, uh, I am from Bihar, uh, which is a state in Eastern India. Uh, we are from a district called Champaran, uh, which Gandhi made famous, or as some in my district say, the district which made Gandhi famous. Uh, then I went to Delhi for my education, joined the civil services, the Indian Administrative Service. The first 10 years of my life, I was in Assam. Uh, that's where I was living and working, except for a two-year detour. I actually came to Washington, D.C. for American University. I was on a fellowship. It's part of the Fulbright system. Uh, after Assam, moved to Ministry of Finance in the uh, government of India. Uh, this was the 1991-92 critical period for us. Uh, I had good mentors. Uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh was my boss. He was the finance oh. minister. And uh, he was very kind. Uh, after two years, he shipped me off to Washington. And uh, oh, wow. he actually, he, he, he put me on the track. Uh, and so I came to Washington to the World Bank. Uh, initially, I was a staff officer to an executive director on the board of the World Bank Group. Uh, but then I decided to stay on. And I spent most of my career in the World Bank Group in what's called the International Finance Corporation, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group, right. which led to the private sector. Did my stint. I was in America, I think, 22, 23 years. Wow. Saw, saw the world on behalf of IFC, uh, World Bank. Uh, I finally left the IFC World Bank uh, at the end of 2013 when I was in Istanbul, uh, in Turkey. I came back to Bihar, my mother was getting old, was getting old. So uh, when I came back, I got a position with the government, of government of Bihar. Uh, people were kind, they gave me something to do here. But this is the time I started reconnecting with uh, my ancestral land, which is in Champaran. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another, and uh, education was something I was always very passionate about. We want to talk about your foundation in a minute. But before we do that, I would like you to tell us a little bit about the IAS and its perceived role in India's uh, bureaucracy. And can you shed some bright lights on how the Indian diplomats compare with those of the leading countries, like the United States and China and others? So the Indian Administrative Service, uh, uh, the members there, primarily work within the country, uh, and they take positions in state governments. Uh, initial period, they work in districts as district magistrates, uh, but then they sort of graduate into policy-making roles. And uh, uh, some of them go abroad for posting, but there's a separate diplomatic core um, where people are recruited into the Indian Foreign Service, uh, who are mostly in the Indian uh, Diplomatic core. I think the quality of people coming into the elite service, IES is an elite service. Uh, it's a very competitive examination. Uh, I think the quality is very good. Uh, I think people, uh, they are quite dedicated or they were quite dedicated. I mean, uh, I joined in 1970s. Uh, uh, it's, it's eons ago. So Obviously, a lot of things must have changed. Uh, right. But no, I think, uh, I think it was a good system. Uh, maybe we can talk about later. Of, yes. Uh, what are my views about it now? But uh, let me not jump ahead. 
has the role of the India civil servant changed over the years? What about the representation of the minorities, especially the Muslims, in the civil service? Is it increasing or decreasing? And how do you tell a young Muslim boys and girls that you have a future as an IAS officer? And what advice would you give it to them in order for them to be a, a, as, as an IS officer, would you tell them that no hope should be high enough for, for them to achieve, no dream should be large enough for them to achieve? Uh, let me start from the last comment which you made. Absolutely. Uh, not only for the IES, but for all dreams. Uh, I mean, the sky is the limit. If you work hard, you, you educate yourself well, uh, you are lucky enough to have good mentors, uh, nothing is beyond your reach. I mean, there are no supermen in life. We are all supermen uh, if we get the right opportunity. So uh, having sort of dealt with that, uh, I think the percentage of Muslims are around 2.5 to 3%. Which in is the pretty Indian, small. Uh, the, the national population ratio is about 14 and a half, 15 right. uh, I mean, ideally we would... Uh, uh, want that in areas of influence, uh, uh, these positions reflect in some way the demographics of a country. And uh, if the demographics are diverse in a large and diverse country like that, uh, like India, uh, yes, I mean, that is definitely a goal one should aspire for. Uh, definitely they should try. Uh, I think there's a lot of good you can do. Uh, but it's, it's not as if there are any magic bullets to this. Uh, okay. Anybody who's good as a student, if you have a good basic education, uh, you, then you become competitive uh, and you can qualify for this service. So what you're really saying, uh, uh, sir, that uh, be the best you can be, exploit your fullest potential and never ever give up. And when you're successful, make other people to be successful, correct? That's what you're saying. Uh, Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about the, uh, how important do you perceive the World Bank so in the current, as Trump said, Wuhan crisis, and which is uh, also known as Chinese uh, uh, coronavirus crisis, particularly in relation to South Asia, as you know that this is a global crisis. And we are living in an unprecedented upheaval that affect our daily lives that we hold dear to who we are as an American, as an Indian, and for the global citizen. Well, I mean, uh, uh, half jokingly, I would first comment that uh, uh, all strong men have a tendency to find fault uh, where no fault lies. Uh, that's not to say that there is some responsibility of the Chinese uh, government to explain uh, how these things come out from their uh, at regular intervals. Uh, uh, so there must be some accountability in an interconnected world uh, where uh, if there is irresponsibility, it just jams up the whole system. Uh, so, and that's a good segue into what the World Bank or institutions like the World Bank can do. I mean, what do you do when the uh, the financial systems are jammed up, the economic systems are jammed up. Uh, you have to introduce uh, some greasing. Uh, you have to get the system to move again. So in a situation where revenues are not coming in, both government revenues and private sector revenues, credit takes on a big role. So institutions which can pump in credit and liquidity into the system are very important. And World Bank can pump in liquidity both on the public sector side and through institutions like the IFC on the private sector side. And uh, this is, uh, I mean, there has to be some forbearance uh, built into this pumping of credit. I mean, we all recognize it's an emergency situation. Uh, so the taps have to be open and World Bank should lead the way. Well, so, so they do have a very important role to play. I wanna change the conversation uh, to talk about something which is near and dear to me, about, about your foundation, and especially the primary focus is mission and goals and objectives. As you know, as I understand, your foundation is empowering girls. So the, so the girls cannot stay in the four walls. They can determine their own destiny. 
because to me, the goals are the promise and potential of not only of India, but the whole world, because it empowers their mind, uplifts the soul. Do you believe that the thing which you're doing it for the empowering the goals is the bridge to the future and also key to the opportunity and it's a gift that will keep on giving. So shed some light on that. And you know the girls in India, especially in Bihar, are trapped in poverty because of lack of education. No, it's not dear, dear to me, uh, the education for, for, for women, for girls. Excellent. I, uh, so uh, let me break that up into two parts. I mean, okay. first, edu first education, and then education for girls. And, and I think, as you pointed out, both are critical. Uh, I mean, uh, I think you believe and I believe that if there's one thing which can transform lives, it's education. I mean, some may argue that winning a lottery might help you. Uh, but one hears so many people becoming alcoholics and with broken marriages after lottery. Uh, but uh, leaving that aside, education has a transformative impact on lives. They can change take you from point A to uh, point B, which you can't even dream about. And I think your life, uh, I mean, you just need, your life illustrates that, is a manifestation of that uh, more than anything else. So education is key and education is critical. So why girls' education? I mean, there's a cliche about this. If you educate a boy, you're educating a man. If you educate a girl, you're educating a family. Right. And uh, if you want society to change on a fast track and jump generations, then I think the key is to educate the womanhood. And today's girl is tomorrow's mother. That is and very well said. So I think that is why it's so critical uh, that girls get an education. And these girls, uh, we are talking about in Champar, and they're rural girls. They come from poor poor background. Uh, so, so the objective is twofold. One is, of course, uh, to make them competent so that they have agency. They can decide for themselves. They can live full lives as educated citizens. But also, we hope uh, that they can get into professions. And, uh, you know, women participation in the labor force in India is abysmally low. Uh, and some of the marginal communities we are working with which are Dalits and Muslims and backwards, uh, they're even lower than that. So uh, it's absolutely critical that we do this. Very well said. As you know, Mr. Hora, I crossed the Atlantic Ocean to get an education, to aim high, work hard, and attain, achieve the American dream. And so can they, because they have every right to pursue their dream. Very well said. Let me, let me change the conversation to about your political engagement, mm -hmm. that you started a political party, the state of Bihar. What is the goal of this party and why you engage in politics? Do you believe that politics define the landscape of a nation? Do you believe that it creates a common cause? Do you believe it, creates, it unifies the people? And is your party interested in giving a voice to those who are voiceless, to those who are underprivileged? to those who are poor and hungry. Is that what you're doing in terms of your party? Uh, I, I couldn't have summarized it better, uh, Mr. Slav. Uh, look, uh, I've been working in the field now for four years, four, five years. And uh, in addition to education, we were also doing some employment generation work. Uh, but it's very clear to me that without a political voice, or political strength uh, and, and ultimately political power. Uh, you can't uh, bend the activities of the government. And there is a scale issue in what we are doing. I mean, we can set up three schools, five schools, 15 schools. I can't set up 500 schools. So if I have to get to that scale, it has to be through the government system. Similarly for job creation. So, one is the need we felt that we needed that political strength to be able to deliver on what we want. The second is the people we work with and whom we want to represent, as you define them, they have been pushed to the political margin. 
I mean, if you have been watching the Indian political scene on the landscape, uh, primarily Dalits and, and I would say Muslims, uh, they have become sort of a political untouchable, if you will. And nobody wants to say that, you know, we want your vote because they think they will alienate uh, the sort of larger sections of community. They need a voice. Uh, they need their own power. They need the ability to take their own decisions. And it's basically because of all these things uh, that we have formed a social co coalition uh, with other people from other uh, communities. And uh, we, are try we have floated a party. It's called the Jan Sangarsh Dal, which means People's Struggle Party. <laughs> wow, it's a, it's a very well said. So people who are struggling and sacrificing. Uh, uh, I'm sort of in agreement with you. To, you're building a party that benefits to all rather than benefits to benefits to as opposed to few people. That's what you're saying. And you are giving the voice because uh, uh, you're right that, the, that the, the current situation in India is filled with hatred and bigotry against the Dalit and the Muslims and minorities. And that must change. In uh, attack on one faith is attack on all faith. And we are tearing apart the harmonious fabric of nation that has been global beacon of hope for democracy and secularism in the world. Correct? No, absolutely. And uh, uh, I mean, one sort of comes to it by thinking that, uh, you know, in our own way, try and use the democratic processes uh, to push back on that uh, challenge to a plural, inclusive, secular India. And, and secondly, if we don't do it, who will do it? Right. I have the means and the education and the strength to do it. So we have to do it. Uh, you pointed out the diversity. Diversity brings the people together. And when you're together, you can help shape a better future for India that becomes a more increasing, increasingly tolerant and inclusive society. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you for coming. This is Frank Islam wishing you a great week. Thank you for watching.